Good evening. Thanks all for coming out all the way back here in the Academy building. <laughs> Couldn't be farther away from the entrance, I think. My name is uh, Nina Dietes and I work as a program maker for CIM Generale. Um, yeah, this is our, not the last event, the other, this is the, yeah, I think in two weeks we'll have our last event with Frans de Waal, but it's almost, almost summer. Um, very, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to summer as well, but also looking forward to this evening. Uh, tonight we will have a, a Let's Ask session, that's a particular program at the Studium Generale that is focused on um, the news, on topical issues, something something that I read in the news and didn't quite understand. I would like some, to hear some context around. And today we will discuss uh, the question, um, why do they kill? Or you could say, why do we kill? Hi, welcome. <laughs> um, and well, the thing in the news was, it, it is, um, I don't know, maybe it's already five or six weeks ago when the, Im the horrifying images from Bucha re reached our phones and our newspapers. Um, and these horrible images of mass destruction and seemingly senseless and random killings in the ongoing war in Ukraine make, make us wonder why uh, people commit such horrendous crimes. Um, who are these perpetrators and what drives them? Why do they torture, maim and kill? Um, Alette Speulers, uh, our speaker of today, will discuss these questions and explain why and under what circumstances even ordinary and otherwise law-abiding people can commit, can come to commit such horrendous crimes. Um, Alette is professor of criminal law and criminology here at the University of Groningen, Faculty of Law, and as well for the University College Groningen. I think there are still some people wanting to join, but... <laughs> Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> I was introducing Aletta. Um, Aletta, her research focuses on international crimes, such as war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and other gross human, human rights violations, as well as terrorism. Um, in the research, Aletta focuses on the causes of international crimes and, crimes and terrorism, the perpetrators of inter international crimes and the crimes, criminal prosecution of these crimes. So the concept of today is that um, Aletta will provide context to this overall question in about 30 minutes. And after that, the floor is open for questions uh, until nine. Um, so write down every question you have during the talk and uh, we'll, discuss, we'll discuss them later. For now, the floor is yours. Aletta. Thank you very much for um, the introduction and the, uh, the invitation to, to give a presentation here. So, uh, and thanks for, uh, for coming on a free Wednesday evening here to, uh, to listen to the story. Um, the main question is, why do they kill? And the focus is on uh, structural and extreme forms of violence. Um, in a structural context like the war in Ukraine, but also Nazi Germany, Rwanda, uh, the genocide there, these types of crimes. And the main question that drove me is why do they kill? Why do co people commit such horrendous crimes? If you look at the crimes they commit, the immediate uh, automatic response that you have is to distance yourself from the crime and the perpetrator because it's such a horrendous and awful act. Um, yet that triggered me in trying to understand what kind of people do such things. And uh, as already said in the introduction, um, in my research the first few years, I realized, well, many of the people who do commit such horrendous crimes are very ordinary, otherwise ordinary law-abiding people. And that made me ask, like, but why and under what conditions do they commit such horrendous crimes? Precisely because if we look at these horrendous crimes, then we feel this distance uh, to the perpetrators and to the crimes and ourselves. So I tried to, first of all, understand why very ordinary people do such things. And an important part of the answer is the context in which people commit 
such crimes. And what is the, are the main features of such a context? Well, first of all, a lot of the crimes like we see in Ukraine right now is this period of armed conflict and structural violence. That is a period in which a lot of people commit horrendous crimes which they would otherwise not commit in very ordinary peaceful circumstances. They wouldn't think of killing another human being, but in a period of armed conflict and structural violence, they do. So that is one important aspect of the context. The second main feature is a lot of these perpetrators have a certain mission. If we look at Ukraine right now, a lot of the very ordinary low-ranking soldiers who were sent to Ukraine were sent there in order to protect their fellow Russians because the propaganda made them believe that there was a genocide going on against the Russian people in Ukraine. So an important reason to go there is actually to protect people. And that, in essence, you could say is a good reason. You protect other people from violence. However, in this case, unfortunately, and that you will see in a lot of these types of, of, of cases, that there's a lot of propaganda behind that, um, like in this case in, uh, in Russia and Ukraine. Um, Another important reason which you see throughout history is that also a lot of people commit such crimes in order to create a better world. And that, for instance, you saw in Nazi Germany, the idea of creating a better world. That was what drove a lot of people to commit horrendous crimes. The Islamic State, too, if we look at them, we see the horrendous and awful crimes they commit. However, if you look at why they commit the crimes, they try to make the world a better place. So the reasons could be in principle good, positive. However, the problem is, is that their vision of the world is very often one in which there is a very clear divide between us versus them. Let's take the example of Nazi Germany. They had this idea, which in principle is nice to make the world a better place. However, in their vision, certain people did not fit into that world and therefore had to be killed. And that makes these kind of missions dangerous because, and that leads to what is called genocide, try to destroy in all or in part a certain group. The Islamic State too, in principle, if you look in their head, what they try to do is create a better world. But there too, the better world is one uh, without all the people who do not have their same extremist, fundamentalist vision of the world. So the ideology plays a very important role, but it's very important to keep that in mind. A lot of these perpetrators don't go there to commit horrendous crimes, they go there to protect people or create a better world, but without a certain group. And then you get this very strong us versus them divide, which you saw very strongly in Nazi Germany, but also many other countries, where they first portray the others as different. Then the next phase is to qualify the others as the enemy, to demonize them, and then to dehumanize them. So these are gradual steps which actually make committing violence very easy at some point. In an ordinary world, we see others as ordinary human beings with the same rights as we have. In these kinds of situations, the group that is eventually attacked is qualified, if I take the example of Ukraine, as Nazis who in fact try to uh, commit murder on the Ukrainians. So that is a big difference. And what you see, as one of the scholars said, you uh, perpetrators very often place their victims outside the moral universe of obligation. And that makes it so much easier to commit the crimes. 
It's not that perpetrators lose their whole morality. It's just that they have a very specific form of morality. Let me give the example of the genocide in Rwanda. In the genocide of Rwanda, a lot of perpetrators still felt that you couldn't uh, kill a fellow human being. But you could trample a cockroach. The point is they saw the victimized group, the Tutsis, as cockroaches. They demonized them, dehumanized them, and then it makes it much easier. So they hold, held on to their morality. However, some people are taken out of the moral universe of obligation. So that is part of the context. Then also a lot of these um, perpetrators are members of militarized organizations. Militarized organizations, sorry, are um, very hierarchically structured, where actually people lost, lose their sense of identity. Rather than having an individual identity, they become part of a collective identity, a member of the military forces. Their names and personalities are no longer important. What happens is that they are just a rank within the organization and they have to obey the people who outrank them, and they can give orders to people who are below them. And that is a strong sense in the military organizations where a lot of people are taught to obey and conform to others, to be disciplined, to do as they are told. So that, um, too, plays a role, and the military also has a very particular task, and this is tied in to the mission. For instance, if we look at the war in the Ukraine now, a lot of these soldiers are part of the Russian army I sent into Ukraine with this specific mission to protect people. And let's not forget the military has the monopoly of violence they may and can use violence. Military training is to a large extent about learning how to use violence. So that uh, plays a role. Then once you're in a war, group dynamics also play an, a, ver a very important role. So taking the example of Ukraine now, a group of soldiers, uh, units uh, go into Ukraine and then they're very small tight groups. A lot of soldiers go into a war with these ideals of protecting the country, the fatherland, and uh, make sure that it's safe. But once they're in a war, what you very often see then that the personal dynamics, the group dynamics, is crucial. At some point, they no longer fight the war for the fatherland, they fight the war for their bodies in the war. Because their lives depend on their bodies in the war. So the group dynamics is extremely important. And within these group dynamics, you see that some people can start to have a, a bigger role, the ones who are the more courageous ones, the ones who uh, are qualified as the more ruthless ones, the ones who keep you safe. So that are the people within a group who ultimately very often decide what, what they do. And individual people in those groups can play a huge and, and big role. That ties into the next thing I put up there, the role models and masculinity. In a war and in an army, very often, the idea is that uh, you can show to be a real man. There are still many cultures where young boys want to go to a war to prove and show that they're real men. But what are real men? Real men are people who are courageous, um, fight for their country, um, uh, are prepared to give their own lives, but also the lack of empathy. Empathy, for instance, is very much more seen as a feminine characteristics. And that is, in the army, unfortunately seen as a very bad characteristic. So the more ruthless people become, the more they are seen as role models and real men. And that affects the whole dynamics in the group. 
What you can have in groups, in armies, and there are groups um, that have been investigated where you see that there's one uh, bad apple in a group, so one uh, very violent perpetrator, for instance, and all the others feel bad about what this person is doing, but no one dares to say so because they are their buddies. They are the people they depend on in a period of war. And that might lead to a situation where one person is violent, all the others dislike it, but no one dares to speak out. Speak out against their buddies. And then they start to join the violence as well. So that is a dynamic that is created within a period of war. Now, let's focus a bit less on periods of war and in general, how can we explain human behavior? Well, what you see in whole social psychology is that human beings are very strongly um, conformed to others. Very often when we get to a situation, we look at others on how to behave. We want to conform, we want to be part of it, we want to obey. Well, in a war, you get a situation where at some point they get the order, for instance, to shoot other people. Well, and then it's extremely hard to disobey that order. A lot of knowledge in social psychology, but also a number of experiments, which I won't go in detail, have shown that people have a very strong likelihood to conform and obey to such an order that they follow. It's, it takes a lot of actually guts to say no to such an order. And to give an example, in, um, during the Vietnam War in Millay, there was a small village and the American uh, soldiers in the Vietnam War were sent to that village with the idea that in that village there would be a stronghold of the Viet Cong. So they were all prepared for a big fight. And then they went to Millay, and in Millay they found only older men, women and children. But they were all so hyped up that at some point um, the order was given to nevertheless shoot. And that triggered this dynamic where they all started to shoot and commit a horrendous crime, officially 128 deaths, but in reality about 500 people died there. And they were clearly massacred because there was not a single shot fired to them. And that is the social dynamic that plays. Why I tell this story is that there was one soldier um, who didn't want to follow that order. He was like, this is bad, this is wrong, these are innocent civilians, we shouldn't be shooting them. But instead of standing up to his commander or going to his group and saying like, this is wrong, he shot himself in the foot. And he did so in order to be carried off in a helicopter out of the uh, war zone and that was the best way he could figure out for himself to prevent following the order. Shooting yourself in the foot might mean that you are the remainder of your life. Uh, you cannot use the foot anymore. You might be an invalid. Uh, less, um, what's the word? Um, that you are handicapped for the rest of your life if you do that. But I think it shows very well how... Um, how the pressure to obey and conform to your mates, especially in a period of war. Now, how can we explain that, that we feel this strong pressure and obey? Because I think um, that is the, the important answer to why so many people can commit horrendous crimes. It's not that we, all of us, have something evil in us. <coughs> It's rather that we have a certain weakness, that we're too, too weak to stand up to the group, too weak to stand up to people in authority. And why is that? How can we explain that? Well, that is, we are social beings. 
Um, a lot of us, and especially uh, students, like to see themselves as individuals and very strongly deciding on their own life. However, in reality, we very much look at how, how other people behave. And we want, and that is one of the main driving forces, we want to belong. The need to belong is very, very strong. And that makes us conform to others and do as others tell. And um, what you see in a group is that people define a certain situation. And members in a group will follow this definition. And that defines their behavior. Let's go back to a situation in war. If we look at the crimes committed by ISIS, the, 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 the horrible terror attacks, we see someone committing an awful crime. That is how we define the situation. However, the perpetrators will define the situation totally different. They define the situation as that they're working to try to get to a better world, make this world a better place by getting rid of the people who they feel spoil it for the rest. Because they want to, if we talk about ISIS, go back to the um, extremist fundamentalist society as it was many, many years ago. So the definition of the situation is, um, is crucial. And here I already said earlier, I already mentioned the us versus them is a very crucial distinction. And that is also what you see in a period of war. People are very scared that suddenly they get into the wrong group. Um, you are with us or you are against us. And that is, for instance, something that, for instance, ISIS said, but also someone like uh, Bush, when he um, tried to uh, warn the world for further terror attacks after 9-11. He said, you're with us or you are against us. And that is cre clearly creating these groups. But that also makes people very scared to um, be pushed into the wrong group. Um, at some point, I went to Rwanda and um, interviewed a lot of perpetrators who participated in, in the genocide. And many of them also said, well, it's hard for you to understand because the world was so different. So they referred to the social context and the social situation. But also, there was one guy in, in Rwanda, it was the uh, genocide of the majority, the Hutus, against the Tutsis. But in Rwanda, there were also people, uh, Hutus, who had a Tutsi wife and nevertheless joined the genocide. Why? Because they wanted to show that they're part of the us and in that way tried to protect their wife and were so scared of being pushed in the dam. So this explains human behavior in general, but even also very strongly within a war. Now, I've tried to explain why what the context is and also why it is so terribly difficult to uh, not follow up on an order. An order, very often in a period of war, to kill uh, or maim someone else, to shoot or to bomb a certain group. So most people who are confronted with such an order will follow the order. In my view, that's, well, um, legally, of course, at that moment, they are already a perpetrator. Because if they indeed follow up the order and shoot and kill someone, they're already a perpetrator. But the actual transformation from being a very ordinary human being into a perpetrator actually occurs, in my view, not so much with their first crime, but with their reaction to the first crime. What do you see in literature if you study perpetrators? Well, almost all perpetrators, and there are only very, very few exceptions, and those are people I assume are sadists, but almost all perpetrators, after they commit their first crime, feel a kind of animal pity. They're shocked about what they've just done. 
and they feel very bad about what they did. They suddenly realize that this other person they just killed, let's take that example, is not an enemy, is, not, uh, uh, is still a person. Soldiers say that sometimes they've killed someone and then they look for a wallet or, or whatever and find pictures and then realize, well, this is still a man. It's not just an enemy, it's a man I just killed. So almost all perpetrators feel, respond with shock and horror to their first crime. And then you get this, what in psychology is called cognitive dissonance. They went to a war trying to do the right thing, defending a country, make the world a better place, and then suddenly they feel confronted with a horrible act they committed themselves, a crime they committed themselves. And cognitive dissonance is this nagging feeling between, I thought I was a good person and I just did something very bad. Now, there are two, we don't like that nagging feeling, so there are two solutions. Either tell yourself, like, this was very bad behavior, I should never do that again. That will be the best option, but it's not easy in a period of war where you have all these others, your buddies, that um, protect you, that you rely upon. So what most perpetrators do, and this is the crucial process in the transformation, they then start to rationalize and justify their behavior. They then start to actually convince themselves that they did the right thing. Yeah, but this person was an enemy. Well, if I hadn't killed him, someone else would have killed him. Well, at least I made it an easy kill. Perpetrators do everything at that stage to soothe their conscience, to make their crime, the crime they committed, into a positive and good act. They were defending the country. And that um, makes it very hard because that is the moment a lot of them start to believe in their own rationalizations and justifications. They start to believe in their own excuses, in the fact that actually it's totally legitimized. What you find in perpetrators is that many perpetrators become more extreme in their ideology after they committed crimes than they did before they committed crimes. Because then killing and the idea that violence is legitimized is still very abstract. But once they killed someone, they have to soothe the conscience, their conscience. And then they do everything to convince themselves. And what you see, and I studied a lot of diaries and letters and uh, biographies, autobiographies, interviews of perpetrators, what you see was almost all of them that the first crime is horrible. They feel very bad about committing it. But then after a while, they get used to it. And I have a quote of a South American uh, torturer which expresses that really well. I can only say that when you first start doing the job, it is hard. You hide yourself and cry. Nobody can see you. Later on, you do not cry. You only feel sad. You feel a knot in your throat. But you can hold back the tears. And after not wanting to, but wanting to, you start getting used to it. Yes, definitely. There comes a moment when you feel nothing about what you're doing. And this is a very typical quote. There are many, many quotes like that from perpetrators who explain, sometimes to their own uh, surprise, that they got used to it. I always use this quote because what I like about this quote is not wanting to, but wanting to. This perpetrator very clearly expresses that uh, there was still in the beginning a sense of I'm doing the wrong thing. So he didn't really want to get used to it, but on the other hand, he felt compelled to still do it. And then it's actually better that you get used to it. And what people can do is that they can limit their empathy or, or push it away or not feel it. 
and therefore no longer have any f empathetic feelings for their victims. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Well, for perpetrators, of course, it's very dangerous because if you don't feel the empathy anymore, you don't feel the cues of stopping that behavior. But there are other situations, like for instance, a medical doctor who needs to do that as well. Why? If a medical doctor would each time that, let's say, uh, a victim of a traffic accident comes in and they feel empathy and start to cry about what happened to the victim, they couldn't um, cure the person, couldn't operate, couldn't perform the medical operation they have to. So it's something that also in other professions is used. For a medical doctor, it's used in a very positive way. But we are in fact happy that doctor could do that and becomes very professional pushing away the feelings. For perpetrators, that's something different, but it's the same mechanism and dangerous. And here you see that perpetrators can go at great length to excuse their own behavior, to rationalize and justify what they do. And here's another quote I will have from uh, Reserve Police Battalion 101, that was a group of Nazis uh, studied by uh, Christopher Browning in his book Ordinary Man. And these were older policemen who, during the Second World War, they were not fanatic Nazis, but they were at some point sent to uh, Poland. And then they were suddenly, unexpectedly asked to line up Jews and shoot Jews. Now, some of them, uh, what was very remarkable in that situation is that the commander didn't like the order, so he gave some people, he said, well, if you don't want to do this, you don't have to. What is intriguing is that Browning said a lot, nevertheless, took part in the killings. Why? And when he asked them why, they said, well, we didn't want to be seen as a coward. That is also shows the pressure of the group. We didn't want to be seen as a coward, so you kill people. And the other example from the, the, the same group is where you can see to what length people go to justify their own behavior. And there was one guy who said, yeah, but I'm not the worst because I, I only kill children. You're like, you only kill children? Aren't that the worst perpetrators to kill the children? No, he had a very good excuse for that. He said, I made an effort and it was possible for me to shoot only children by the hand. My neighbor then shot the mother and I shot the child that belonged to her because I reasoned with myself that after all, without its mother, the child could no longer live. Well, what you see here is this is plain murder, part of a genocide of the destruction of all the Jews in the area. But the perpetrator transforms this in some kind of mercy killing. Convinces him himself that he's actually doing a good thing, doing the right thing. So this um, shows to what length we can go. Um, with this part, I hope to have explained how very ordinary law-abiding citizens can become perpetrators. Briefly, I want to focus now on the questions, are all perpetrators the same? Well, no, there are many differences in levels of power, different roles, different um, motives. And especially these types of crimes are part of structural violence, where you see that you have leaders at the top. Let's take uh, the example of, uh, of Ukraine. Putin would be at the top. He is very important in deciding the policies, but he is not the one actually physically uh, killing other people. That are the low-ranking perpetrators. So there you have big differences. People at the top are very often motivated by power, careerism, status, uh, money. And a lot of these perpetrators um, are narcissists in the sense that they uh, have a very high uh, sense of themselves. Um, many of them are psychopath, and uh, together with Machiavellianism, this is called the dark 
tea trade is that they do everything to stay in power. Now, Putin was someone who made himself a career by being extremely loyal. That was how he suddenly and unexpected got in a position of power, because he showed that he was loyal. But that is also what he demands of all his people around him. And then you get to what in literature is known the dictator's dilemma. A lot of people said, well, Putin was totally surprised by the fact that it wasn't that easy to invade and win the war in Ukraine. And the problem is there, he had so many loyal people around him who were also very much interested in power, careerism, status, money, that these people just told him what he wanted to hear rather than the reality. So the top leaders are a very specific uh, group. Then of the others, um, middle and low ranking perpetrators, quite a lot of them are very ordinary law abiding citizens, but they can have very different motives. You've got the careerists and the profiteers who in such a period try to profit from the situation. Um, you have people, and that's maybe the largest group, just the followers and the conformists who just go along because that is what you do. There's also a certain group, the fanatics, holy warriors, true believers, who very much believe in a certain ideology and are sometimes very strongly driven by hatred. And then there is also a group which are less normal, that are the people who are very violence prone. And I call them the predators, the sadists, and some are mentally disturbed. That are also people who are drawn to the violence. What you see with ISIS, for instance, is that a lot of people are fanatics, uh, very strongly believe in the ideology, but there's also a large group who are in fact very violent people and felt attracted to ISIS, not because of the ideology, but because the ideology gave them an excuse to outlive their violent impulses. For instance, the guy who was responsible, Boulel, for the horrible terror attack in Nice, where he went with a truck through the um, killing about 80 people driving uh, where people were, were partying the, the national day. He was clearly someone who had a history of mental disturbances, extremely violent problem behavior, etc but he felt attracted to ISIS. So that is also what you have in periods of war, that sometimes, or terrorism, that sometimes these people are attracted to those movements. You also have, within a war, you get this dynamics of the Avengers, people who've been wronged and then they want to get even, get back. So that is in a war which creates another dynamic. And lastly, sometimes you have perpetrators, which I call the compromised perpetrators, who are forced to help the, uh, perpetrators, uh, the perpetrator group. And sometimes they're um, uh, members of the victims community themselves. Look at Nazi Germany, where a lot of, um, for instance, in the Netherlands, a lot of Jews were um, arrested and then they were told like either we put you on a, uh, a train straight to Auschwitz where you will die or you help us betray others. Well that's and some of them did that and there was one very sad case where one woman betrayed over 100 fellow Jews. Well she is still a perpetrator because she betrayed so many people but someone who was extremely put under pressure. Um, I'm almost done. Um, so, to summarize, the sad uh, truth is that the most horrendous crimes in the world have been perpetrated, have been committed by people who tried to make the world a better place, who believed they were doing the right thing. And that shows the danger of ideology, of fake news, of propaganda. And um, one of the most I find uh, impressive quotes I came along in the Millet massacre, I already explained what the Millet massacre was about, 
was one perpetrator in a documentary made many years later. He was talking about what happened that day and he ended with a quote in the documentary saying, we were supposed to be the good guys. And I think that is the main problem. A lot of people go somewhere believing they are the good guys, but that is also the main danger. If you believe you're the good guys fighting the bad guys, then evil can masquerade as good, whereas in fact you are the perpetrator like this guy in Millet. So getting back to the question, why do they kill? The context strongly affects us. War we can see as an atrocity producing situation and people get caught up in a spiral and can, this can spiral into extreme violence. And the answer is, why do we commit these crimes? Well, very often it's more that we are weak rather than evil. Thank you for your attention. Now it works, yes. Thank you very much, Elaten. The floor is open for questions. Who wants to go first? I was, I was thinking about the interviews you did with uh, the perpetrators in Rwanda. Did you ask them about regret, having regrets? And that's, is that also the point where you can make this shift? Uh, the um, slide 10, I think, where you can see the sadists or the followers? Or yeah. Where do you see... It's, what it's, type they are. Yeah, it's sometimes, but not always. The, the, the problem with regret is if you start to feel regret, that also means that you acknowledge that you did something wrong. And even many years after a period of mass violence, that's the most difficult thing for human beings to do, to admit that they were wrong. Mm. And especially if you committed horrendous crimes, it's so much easier to believe that you still did the right thing. And um, it's not a very popular topic, but you still have a lot of perpetrators who are traumatized after, uh, after uh, such a period of mass atrocities. Um, but those who are traumatized are probably the most sympathetic ones because they at least realize that they did something wrong. But the more you did wrong, the more there is this pressure to keep holding on to the rationalizations and the justifications. And for instance, with uh, the Millet massacre, there is uh, one guy, uh, Fernando Simpson is his name, and he was interviewed one year after Millet because initially uh, no one knew about Millet and then pictures uh, turned up in Life magazine. And he was interviewed then, and he still had this, this attitude like, I just followed orders, uh, I just did what I had to do, and why do you blame me? Uh, so he didn't show any regret or remorse. But many years later, purely by accident, his son got killed by a uh, bullet. And it was not meant to kill him, but uh, yeah, someone let a gun go off, and it hit his little boy, so he went outside with his boy in his hand, and that actually, when he saw his own son dying in his hand, his hands, he, he suddenly thought back of Millet, and that triggered all the guilt. And that made him turn into a nervous wreck, because then suddenly he realized what he had been doing. And um, yeah. You have to wait for the microphone, otherwise the people at home won't hear you or hear the question. Could you pass it on? Uh, I fully uh, understand and appreciate that you approached it from an, uh, an armed conflict uh, situation, but there are other situations where you could ask the question, why do they kill? Uh, and I wonder how they fit in into your overall categorization. For instance, the school shootings in the USA, is that very different or does it clearly fit in in one of the situations that you painted? I can think of examples myself, but I would yeah. love to hear. Um, well, my own research uh, focuses very much on the structural forms of violence, so indeed war situations, but also a dictatorship and terrorism, so much less on school shooters. However, 
there is a certain uh, parallel uh, in some ways. Um, for instance, the, the school shooting in Columbine, which is very often seen as, as the first uh, school shooting, what you see there is also what played a, a very big role is the, the dynamic between the two perpetrators who actually committed that. One was clearly a narcissist, um, the other was very suicidal, uh, and this combination uh, led to the extreme acts. So you see a certain parallel there. Um, quite a lot of uh, school shooters would actually fit under the mentally disturbed, because many of them are mentally uh, disturbed. So there are also parallels and there's some research done on a parallel between the school shooters and some of the terrorists. But with terrorists uh, we have to be careful. Initially it was thought that all terrorists would be mentally disturbed but that clearly showed is not true. However, with ISIS, you do see that a lot of mentally disturbed people felt attracted to ISIS because of their very violent uh, nature. Um, but some perpetrators like um, what well, was Breivik, there are clear signs that he was mentally disturbed. And also uh, for the older people, the Yuna bomber, Kaczynski, um, who was also more mentally disturbed. So there are parallels to, to school shooters. Um, thank you very much for this interesting uh, uh, presentation and um, I believe you are an expert in international law and uh, when I listen to your presentation I think there's a very big responsibility as well for the, the people, not so much the leaders at the top well also, but also the, the, the sergeants and the colonels or whatever we may call them that sort of maybe sort of can keep their uh, soldiers in track when they misbehave. Yep. And, and is that in any way, uh, how is this translated in international law? I mean, we know that uh, Karachi and, and people alike are there uh, or they are sent to prison. But now there's this, I would say, poor young man, uh, Russian young man of 20 years old, sent to prison for life. But the people in, in, in that, that sort of direct these, these soldiers, yep. How do we deal with that? Is there any way of controlling that? Yeah, um, well, I think that is one of the major problems with international uh, criminal law is, in fact, the people, uh, this type of research, my own research, but also of many others who study perpetrators, actually show that the people at the top create a certain situation in which others commit uh, the crimes. Um, according to international criminal law, based also on criminal law, you can only be prosecuted and punished um, if you did something wrong and had uh, what they call the mens rea, a guilty mind of doing something. When uh, leaders or top leaders or surgeons or, or other give very clear orders, then you could say, look, you gave an order to that uh, person, so you're responsible. However, unfortunately, a lot of these leaders have become wiser now with the International Criminal Court. So they don't give direct orders anymore. They just send people somewhere. And then it makes it a lot harder to, to prosecute them. Um, that, that is a problem. Um, you do see... Um, like the middle ranking, the middle cater, uh, there's also this concept of what they called uh, command responsibility. And unlike, as you would suspect, hearing that word, you might think command responsibility is they're responsible for directly ordering crimes, but command responsibility is in fact that they're responsible that they know things are going on, but don't act. Um, and that is also important where some surgeons who, who say, well, they didn't give the direct order to, for instance, kill or, as you often see, rape the women, but they knew it was going on, so they're still responsible for not punishing the soldiers who did that. So there are some mechanisms there, but it's far from perfect, unfortunately, yet. I hope that answers your question. You mentioned one of the perpetrators who was suddenly hit by his uh, guilt. 
And I was just wondering, when that happens, have you noticed that there's, they're not only, they don't only become a nervous wreck, but they, for example, have a higher risk of suicide or they really, really struggle to cope? Do they completely deteriorate or are there some that do actually reconcile with their past or... Yeah. And if so, how do they go about that? Yeah, there, there, there are many different ways this can happen. The, the guy I just told you about, Fernando Simpson, who was partially responsible for Millet or participated in Millet, he became a nervous wreck and tried to commit suicide several times and eventually succeeded, so he, he killed himself. Um, there are other situations, a lot of these perpetrators who admit to the guilt and admit to the fact that they're wrong, they suffer from nightmares, uh, nervous breakdowns. Um, what you also see, some try to reconcile. There is a um, soldier in the war in former Yugoslavia, and I cannot remember his name now, but he was very low-ranking uh, soldier, and he was... Um, yeah, not really mentally disturbed, but he had a personality where he easily followed other people. So he did that, and later on he realized he was punished for that, he was imprisoned, that he thought, like, this, this was wrong. So he tried, after his punishment, to find the people he um, hurt and he uh, mistreated and tried to reconcile with them. So that happens too. In this case, I must say that the victims weren't uh, that open for any reconciliation. Um, so that could happen. And what you also see is some perpetrators try to put the rest of their lives uh, in trying to do good, in trying to um, yeah, change uh, the world and, for instance, work with children or give presentations on what made them Perpetrators. There's a book uh, by Ishmael Bea, he's a child soldier who committed terrible crimes and he tried to write a book to explain what he did and he is now a human rights activist. So that are also things that, that happen. And actually a uh, kind of intriguing story is also when the ICC, the International Criminal Court, opened, which was in 2002. Uh, apparently, uh, I was told by someone at the ICC um, that a Japanese war criminal, so Japanese war criminal from the Second World War, sent a letter to the ICC like, please prosecute me. So, um, because he felt he did wrong and he wanted to, to be punished in order to get over it. So, there are all different ways of that perpetrators deal with that. I hope that answered your question. Thanks. Um, how should we look at the justifications made by the perpetrators who commit the crime? Like, should we see that as like a good thing or a bad thing, or is that just something neutral that happens? Um. Well, actually, I think um, if you look at perpetrators, it's a bad thing because due to these rationalizations and justifications, that makes uh, further crimes possible and actually also probable. So it's a very dangerous uh, mechanism. On the other hand, where does it come from? Sometimes perpetrators do that very consciously but it's also an unconscious mechanism that all of us have in order to protect our psychological self, ourself. Um, for instance, you can draw parallels to children who have been abused uh, when they were very young. They very often also have certain mechanisms where they deny what happened, sometimes create a separate personality. These are all um, unconscious, subconscious mechanisms. So the mechanisms in themselves are good because they protect the individual, but within this context, they lead and make us into perpetrators. And that is very dangerous. And then you end up with a situation where if we look at many of the crimes that have been committed in, in history, we think it's awful, whereas if they look at it with their um, the rationalizations and justifications, 
they are like, oh, it's fairly normal. It's not that bad what we did. And that is the danger. So, yeah, they're, they're important mechanisms in other situations, very dangerous here. Uh, Alain, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, presentation. I, I really enjoyed this, and I think that awareness of people probably being like a also a victim of their own situation, committing these crimes, is, is very important also for perhaps for criminal legal uh, professionals. Um, how um, should these like the, the, the conclusions of your research affect punishment. Um, yep. and, and how should courts, in your view, deal with these conclusions of your research? Yeah. Um, well, I think um, it's important to uh, prosecute and punish perpetrators because um, that is also a way to... Um, explain what happened to show that what happened was wrong, to reinstate the victims. For victims, what is very important, uh, victims know what happened. So there's the knowledge, but you also have the acknowledgement. That, uh, and that is what courts can do. They acknowledge that something really bad happened. And think, for instance, of um, victims in, in genocidal regimes. They were seen as subhumans, uh, and people could do anything to them, so a court is, is crucial in, um, in actually acknowledging what happened. So that is important as to punishments. Well, I believe on the basis of my research that the people high up in the hierarchy play such an important role. And for instance, a lot of crimes that have been uh, committed, for instance, the, um, the picture uh, here of, of this woman, she was very clearly uh, a civilian who, uh, who was just shot on the street. Now, someone like Putin and his generals did not kill her themselves directly. However, they created the context in which others did. So I think for punishment, that should also be taken into account. And it was already mentioned there is one soldier who committed crimes, and he has a very long prison sentence, but actually those higher up in the chain of command are more responsible. That said, I do think, and I strongly believe, on the basis of, of, of my research, that the most important thing is not to... Uh, just identify the perpetrators and prosecute and punish them, actually, uh, it's, it's, it's very important to realize that everyone could do that. We won't make our world a safer place by merely saying those are the people who did horrible things and they're evil people, because then you make the same mistake as many perpetrators make. You make a distinction between good people, evil people. And I think the realization, the knowledge that each and every one of us could do that under certain circumstances is the best way to prevent this, because then you can prevent these circumstances. And I think I, I refer back to this, actually it's here on this slide, uh, the American soldier, we were supposed to be the good guys. Yeah, exactly, because he believed himself to be a good guy, uh, he thought he couldn't commit a crime. Well. That is the main problem. If he had realized it's not about good people, bad people, because sometimes good people commit horrendous crimes. So law is important, criminal law is important, punishment is important, but I think it's even more important to understand and to understand the circumstances and try to prevent them from occurring. I just wanted to add to that question. Uh, I have the micro, so I can do it. <laughs> um, I can't help but think about war being a very lucrative business for yeah. uh, some parties, at least. Weapon industry, for, for instance, how do they come into this um, system of justice? Um, yeah, well, that, that is a problem. War, yes, is very lucrative business, so there are a lot of arms dealers who win a lot uh, by war, people in certain situations, and that are the, the profiteers. And they, 
um, distance themselves a bit from the crimes, like uh, it's not the guns that kill people, it's people holding the guns that kill people, but that is just an excuse, of course. And unfortunately, um, yeah, a lot of people have to gain uh, do gain from the war, and in, in my topology, that would be the profiteers. Uh, they, they, they do it for profit. Yeah, I was wondering, um, do you see a possibility where we could create a military without a hierarchy? So where you have a flat hierarchy military, if we would, for instance, yep. introduce flat hierarchy in uh, society, businesses, and governance? Yeah, I think in a way it would be good if you get rid of the hierarchy, the obedience, the conformism. On the other hand, uh, an army can only function if people listen. If you're in a war and the commander says, okay, we go uh, to, to the right side. Um, you couldn't fight a war if everyone starts to argue like, no, I think it's better if you go to the left or to the front or to the back or if we withdraw. So that would make um, the whole military very ineffective. On the other hand, um, I think the military should be much more aware of the possibilities and the dangers of what a period of war is and, and what the dangers are. Uh, they might go in with all the good intentions, believing they're the good guys, but have to be aware of what might happen, that they might commit horrendous crimes there. And in the military, I think awareness of that would be maybe the more um, possible option. Uh, the other one is not really viable, it would be ideal but not viable. Um, but soldiers need to be prepared for when they go into war. The Ukrainians, a lot of these soldiers were totally surprised by the opposition of the Ukrainians because they really believed like we are bringing them freedom. Um, and that is something soldiers have to be aware of. I, I read some of the letters of soldiers who went to a period of war and they were trained to obey, to conform, to shoot, to kill, etc. all the military operations. But then one guy, one soldier wrote home a letter home and he said, Mom, they're crazy. They're shooting at me. Like, yeah, of course, it's a war. Um, but a lot of people are not prepared for that. And I think there we can win a lot and show the dangers of, like, we are not immune from doing horrible things. I think one of the most important lessons is realize that we could do horrible things as well. And then think about how to prevent that so that you have internal mechanisms that at some point you are able to stop it. But that's not easy. But, yeah, your solution, I, I like it, but I think it won't... Pull through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we kind of touched upon this already, or you did, but um, I was just wondering, in your opinion, um, like, does the international criminal law, like, actually have the means to appropriately judge these kinds of situations? Because you also mentioned the ICC, and, uh, yeah, the ICC... Like is I don't know I don't want to say problematic but definitely has difficulties operating with like countries not ratifying the statute and all of this so I was just yeah wondering about your opinion on this. Um, yeah, the ICC does have options, but not that many. There's so many uh, violations that have been committed. But uh, the ICC only has a limited um, budget, time, money to, to prosecute people. So, so that is a problem. Um, the other problem is how do you see this type of behavior? Um, a lot of these perpetrators, with the exception of the sadists, the predators, the mentally disturbed, but all the other perpetrators are not really likely to, outside of the period of structural violence, to commit further crimes. A lot of the perpetrators that you saw, for instance, Nazi Germany, there were very few who, uh, after they joined the genocide, they showed extremely violent behavior. They didn't do so in their private life. So their crimes are very context-related. 
However, on the other hand, these crimes are generally called the crimes of all crimes. So should you punish them harsher or less harsh, etc.? And these are still debates. And also, for instance, who is more to blame? And I can remember a discussion with my students a number of years ago where I had two students from former Yugoslavia. And that was actually really interesting because both of them unfortunately lost family members uh, and they fled to the Netherlands and started uh, to study at university, so they ended up both in my class. And then we had the discussion, who is to blame more? The, um, the actual low-ranking perpetrators or those higher up? And they had a totally different opinion on that. Uh, one of the two said, no, this, this, this guy, he was our neighbor and he killed my uncle. I want him in prison. I don't care about people like Milosevic or Karacic. He did it. Whereas the other was much more like people like Milosevic, Karacic, Cecilia and all the others. Um, they created the conflict. They should be punished more. So there are also differences of opinions there. And it's, it's, it's very hard to say what the right path is. What time is it? Um, with that, I want to thank you very much for joining in. And of course, Aleta taking the time to share insights on such a difficult topic. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, I have a book in the Stine Generale tradition. It's by Ig Michael Ignatieff. He spoke about two weeks ago at Stine Generale. The title is on, on Consolation, but it's mainly about resilience of the humankind. And yeah, it's a hopeful book. So okay. with that, thank, thank you very you. much. And um, well, hope to see you maybe at Francois or otherwise after the summer. Have a good evening. Thank you.